which is something that should be everyone should know but at this point in my opinion based on uh if they want to remain healthy on cycle if they want to not inhibit their progress unnecessarily if So guys, Derek, moreplacemoredays.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about do DHT derivatives actually inhibit estrogen or not? So this is something that is heavily debated. A lot of people, they think it, uh, you know, they can act as a makeshift AI. Some people, they think that it actually inhibits the um, estrogen from working itself. Actually, most people just don't even know how it works. They just know that at most, some people think more DHT equals, you know, less estrogen. And that's kind of like the basis of their you know, explanation. And I just wanted to kind of dig into the mechanism to explain the ratio of androgens to estrogens a bit and how DHT derivatives can actually play out when you factor they factor in their androgenicity and sort of how they complement cycles that are rich with compounds that are substrates for aromatase. So if you have a lot of compounds that convert to estrogen, what kind of effect the DHT derivatives could have on potentially minimizing that estrogenic activity when it is too high and you know somebody might otherwise introduce an aromatase inhibitor which you know my thoughts on that um i've talked about the neuro and cardiotoxicity and blah 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 and how blah anyway anyway let's get, let's just get into it so you know there's a very clear relationship between androgens to estrogens and especially in like gyno development i feel like that's a very good proxy for estrogenic activity in the body at least for people who are prone like there's a lot of other things that can be used as proxies as well as like blood work isn't really indicative just an absolute value of estradiol and picograms per milliliter um doesn't necessarily equate to just because you have a high estrogen on paper it doesn't mean your estrogen dominance or something because your ratio of free androgens to estrogen could be fine to an extent where you're not developing gyno even though you have a 70 um, pg per ml estradiol so the thing is is one thing i should mention too actually before i forget is there's obviously factors that play into estrogen metabolism that have to do with polymorphisms and uh, genes and stuff like that where somebody could have very slow estrogen metabolism or just impaired metabolism or different uh you know preferen preferential pathways of where it metabolizes their estrogen in different conjugates and different fucking like metabolites of hormones like everyone deals with stuff differently and this is why there's such varying individual response to drugs and side effect profile among certain things and a lot of it can boil down to you know like how good is your liver at detoxifying so if you have some guy who has a bunch of polymorphisms that impair detoxification processes and they have another guy who's super efficient obviously comparing oh you got gyno at you know this level of estrogen the exact same another guy with the exact same free androgen profile and free uh, circulating estrogen profile it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to both get gyno with the exact same drug load with the exact same estrogen load in the body because one might be super efficient at getting it out of there another one might not be another one might have more aromatase expression in this tissue one might not it all kind of boils down to individual specific factors but at the end of the day, the thing that still dictates much of what kind of activity occurs is the free androgen to free estrogen profile in the body. And when I say free, I mean not bound to SHBG because what a lot of people don't realize is DHT has a five times higher binding affinity for sex hormone binding globulin than testosterone. So just because like estrogen, you know, it has a lower affinity than both of them. So if you have all your androgens bound up by SHBG or a significant amount of them, Obviously there's less free androgens to go be anti-estrogens essentially where you need it to be. But if you have a significantly higher amount of DHT, even if you're free T, like if you have a high free DHT, that is largely what's going to boil down to, do you have anti-estrogenic properties via your hormone profile or not? Now that's kind of a vague statement. Let me, let me get into it further before I explain. So basically the more free androgens you have not bound up and like can actually go around and do their stuff, that's going to dictate how much potential anti-estrogenic activity you can actually accomplish via your hormone profile. So by that, I mean, essentially what we never understood is does the DHT in our body or the testosterone that's free or any of the DHT derivatives we use, um, do those actually inhibit aromatization? Like do they decrease estrogen levels? Because that's often what we think 
is what often what is proposed of what's happening. People say, oh, you know, use proviron, it's an anti-estrogen, or master on anti-estrogen. The reality is none of them decrease estrogen levels. What they do do though, is decrease estrogen-induced RNA transcription at the receptor site. And this occurs after estrogen binds to the estrogen receptor. It's not like, it's not like the DHT goes in there or the DHT derivative goes in there and then like prevents estrogen from binding to the receptor like a, like a serum or something like that. Like it's not like it occupies it or something like that. It seems like what it actually does is it's after, it's subsequent to estrogen receptor binding that it actually induces its anti-estrogenic properties, which is really interesting because a lot of people think, oh, you take Mastron, you take Proviron, it lowers your estrogen levels. No, it doesn't. It actually has no effect on that whatsoever. What it does do, well, obviously you could argue it does depending on the context. If you were like only taking that and you suppress testosterone, then there's less testosterone to aromatize the estrogen, blah, blah, blah. For the sake of argument, we're already shut down. We're on gear. We're using, you know, like, I don't know, testosterone and Mastron or something like that. So the testosterone aromatizes the estrogen. Estrogen normally, you know, binds to estrogen receptors and um, induces uh, RNA transcription. And then the DHT that has 5-alpha reduced from testosterone and uh, the drostanolone, the Mastron or whatever we're using is the DHT derivative in this example. Um, that's the same compound, by the way, if you didn't know. Um, <laughs> goes and it doesn't just like, like wipe out estrogen out of the system, nor does it go bind to the estrogen receptor at least from what I can tell in the data, or at least from what I can extrapolate, it seems like, like it says in here, I'm gonna read this statement here. This was called evaluation of androgen antagonism of estrogen effect by dihydrotestosterone. So it doesn't matter if this is DHT necessarily, it's simply an androgen. So the androgenicity of another anabolic androgenic steroid like Masteron is going to accomplish this via the exact same mechanism. It's just the tissue selectivity and the androgenicity is going to vary accordingly based on the compound. But you can extrapolate this for yourself based on the same mechanism of action here. So these findings suggest that the mechanism of DHC antagonism of estrogen effect in this organ system does not involve inhibition of synthesis of estrogen receptor as has been shown for progesterone, but appears to occur by decreasing estrogen induced RNA transcription at a point subsequent to estrogen receptor binding. So that is key to keep in mind because after receptor binding, so that means it's not preventing it from binding. It's not reducing the amount of aromatization occurring. It's not being an anti-estrogen. It's literally preventing the estrogen from doing what it's supposed to do in the body. So even after it's bound to the receptor, DHT or whatever androgen DHT derivative you're using literally goes in and like fucks with the receptor to the point that it doesn't allow the estradiol to do what it's supposed to do even after it's bound so how exactly that mechanism occurs it decreases it that's what we know we know where it does it how it does it is kind of remains a bit unseen but what we do know is that it prevents the body from transcribing its effects in tissues like it normally would it's almost like it goes in there and confuses the bound bound part to the receptor and tells it it tells it its instructions are no longer working correctly which is interesting so is this just like the body's way of telling you if you otherwise had excessive amounts of dht it would be you know you would think your body would be doing it for a reason to maintain some homeostatic process to get to some end result or else there wouldn't be that androgen there so if you have an excess free androgen profile, that thing is providing some signal that's preventing the other signal from working correctly. How exactly it's doing that is above and beyond my fucking expertise. <laughs> but we, what we can see is that it has nothing to do with wiping estrogen out of the body. It's not an aromatase inhibitor. It's not an anti-estrogen. It's something that literally opposes the RNA transcription after binding. So even if you have these sky high estrogen levels on paper, if you have enough androgens in there, it's going to go to all these receptors and tell them to like not do what they're supposed to do, which is interesting because it doesn't actually have anything to do with aromatase. So you could, on paper, you have a lot of guys proactively inhibiting the enzyme aromatase just because they see a number on a piece of paper where they may not even have a clue that they have more than enough free androgen in their system to inhibit that estrogen induced RNA transcription that would otherwise in the lack of sufficient androgens there 
cause gyno or cause these estrogenic overflow issues that you might not even need to worry about. So just because you have an 80, 90 picogram per milliliter estradiol, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to run into issues if there's enough free androgen there to fuck with the receptor and tell it to not do what it's supposed to do. At least that's what it appears to be. And that's probably why a lot of people can get away with running. You know, guys with good genes or can run, you know, like several, several hundred milligrams, even some guys upwards of like 750 plus of test without an AI, without getting gyno, maybe their body's just very good at uh, five alpha reducing to DHT and getting that to the fucking receptor and telling it to not do what it's supposed to do. Or they have incredibly efficient estrogen metabolism it doesn't really, you know, there's a lot of different factors that can play into it. But at the end of the day, you don't need to proactively inhibit aromatase just because of a number on a piece of paper, which is something that should be, everyone should know, but at this point, in my opinion, based on uh, if they want to remain healthy on cycle, if they want to not inhibit their progress unnecessarily, if they want to maintain um, proper growth cascades via the GHIGF1 axis mediated through estrogen, um, there's a lot of things that really warrant not proactively inhibiting aromatase for no reason. Like some people are just popping aromatase like candy just because they see, oh, I'm not in the 20 to 30 picogram per milliliter range. I need to be on aromatase right now, even though they have more than enough free DHT to support the anti-estrogenic activity at the receptor subsequent to binding that would be necessary to prevent any of these issues from occurring in the first place. So now not only do they have the prevention of the you know, at the receptor site, but then on top of that, they're inhibiting aromatase to the point where they're getting, potentially you might even have a 20 to 30 picogram per milliliter estradiol, but maybe you're even still getting that anti-estrogenic activity at the receptor and you're getting the equivalent of a much less amount of estrogen, even though on paper you have an in-range level that looks healthy. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, if you're cranking hard and you're on an aromatase inhibitor and you have a DHT derivative, that might otherwise have a significant anti-estrogenic activity subsequent to estrogen receptor binding. You could be, even though on paper you think you're in the sweet spot, you may be fucking yourself because you could be getting this anti-estrogenic activity plus the anti-aromatase. So, you know, just something to keep in mind and is something that um, I think a lot of people would argue is a more well thought out approach to um, dealing with estrogenic issues is Obviously, the main approach would be just not reaching that point to begin with where you then need to burden yourself potentially with more free androgens to inhibit this estrogen-induced RNA transcription above and beyond what you otherwise need. Like ideally, you would just, you know, fulfill the baseline amount that you can get before you even need to worry about that and then start like stacking on top with more tissue-selective anabolic agents. So then you don't need to kind of like pull things back. I don't know. It's kind of, it kind of depends on the person again, though, and the, cert, the situation and the goals, of course. But um, I just think there are a lot of steps that make more sense to do proactively before you kind of go nuclear and start inhibiting, indiscriminately inhibiting the aromatase enzyme in your brain and your heart everywhere you need it. You know what I mean? So like there's ways to deal with this receptor activity that are potentially better alternatives to inhibiting aromatase. It's kind of like the end of the video, the whole point of the video. And just because there's a number on a piece of paper, doesn't necessarily mean shit. So take that into account. So like there's a good reason why drugs like, you know, like drostanolone used to be used to treat breast cancer prior to the development of novel selective estrogen receptor modulators. And obviously the androgenicity is what largely limited its uh, efficacy in a clinical context for women. But I mean, you know, it was very good at what it was doing and what it was intended to do, minus the side effect profile of masculinization. For guys, it's less of a big deal. Unless you care about hair loss, you're gonna get fucked if you use Masteron and you're prone to hair loss. But anyways, it's very good at anti-estrogenic activity at the, uh, at the breast. So that's why it was deployed clinically for that exact reason. And it largely boils down to exactly what I just explained. So um, take that into account when you are designing your protocols is that um, DHC derivatives and just things with high levels of Andrew, cause not, this doesn't apply to all DHC derivatives, by the way, they're all just because they're derived from DHT. Some are far more tissue selective than others. Some are far more androgenic than others. It doesn't necessarily mean they're all gonna do this. So keep that in mind when you're designing your protocols too. But just in general, this is something to take into account and maybe leverage for a more, uh, I don't know, health conscious. I don't even know if that's the right word, but a, a potentially a smarter overall approach to 
um, cycle design, in my opinion. So take from that what you will. Thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe, comment. Helps the algorithm when you guys comment. So it's very much appreciated when you do. Follow me on Instagram, at more plates on our show, more dates, Facebook, Snapchat, bitch, you, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, check out anything I'm associated with. Video description below. Um, I don't know if people actually listen to this. I'm assuming, hopefully they do. But, um, you know, anything that supports me is in the video description. Sometimes when I say this, I don't know if it's just like, oh, it's... You know, the robot outro is going now and like it just goes over the head of everyone watching or not. But um, anything in the video description does support me. So it's much appreciated when you guys check that stuff out. Like if you are interested in TRT or HRT in general, and I feel like that applies for a lot of guys watching my stuff, I would highly recommend you check out my HRT clinic. It's linked in the description below. You can save $50 off your first treatment with the coupon code MPMD50. It's not just limited to testosterone replacement therapy. There is a wide array of treatment options for a wide array of different things. And just to get an idea of all the stuff that we treat, check out the medications page and there's a wish list option. You can kind of create a, a cart of sorts that then lets our patient care coordinators know what exactly you're interested in. So then they can kind of own in on how to, you know, best help you and get you to your goals the easiest as opposed to starting from scratch and trying to like you know put in way more legwork when you could otherwise just give a short list of what you're looking for exactly and if they can you know accommodate that or not and if it's conducive to you know your overall health optimization and whatnot and then from there you basically just talk to the pcc the patient care coordinator over skype facetime zoom get uh, hooked up with one of our doctors who then talks to you over Skype, FaceTime, Zoom as well, all from the comfort of your own home. You don't even need to leave the fucking house unless you, <laughs> unless you need to get baseline blood work. And it's, it's a way of the future, in my opinion, telemedicine. And um, from there, you get prescribed whatever you need, shipped to your door, super convenient. And um, honestly, the team at Evolve is, I vetted them for a long time before I uh, bought equity in the company and um, they reflect the level of information I put out in my videos. And uh, I couldn't recommend them more highly myself. And that's where I get my TRT, obviously, too. And anything else I'm associated with, Gorilla Mind, my turnkey nootropic formulas for productivity, focus, um, mental clarity, whatever it is. These are great for anybody who has long hours, uh, grinding 14, 16 hour work days. This is the only thing that can get me through the day, frankly, nowadays. And uh, I designed them in my university years and now going into my working years, I still, uh, use these formulas on a nearly daily basis, to be honest. And um, they help really crank out high quality work above and beyond what you would otherwise be capable of without them, in my opinion. They're the most top-notch nootropics in the industry, bar none, in my opinion. And the pre-workout formulas, Gorilla Mode, Gorilla Mode Nitric, also stand above the rest in this industry as well. Um, and it's pretty transparent why, like just look at the label compared to whatever you're using right now. I'm sure a lot of you guys do use pre-workout. If you do, just, I encourage you to pull out the jug Look at the label, look at the label on Gorilla Mode, look at the label on Gorilla Mode Nitric and see the dosages and see the combination of ingredients. And it becomes, <laughs> becomes pretty obvious why you should switch in my opinion. And anything else I'm associated with, video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.